Now I come to the advantages of small states, drawing, so to speak, the conclusion uh, from the description of the, yeah, of the disadvantages of centralization, political centralization, and monetary centralization. Um, first, it is important to recognize that historians are by and large agreed on the explanation why it is that Europe became the wealthiest region in the world um, as compared to, let's say, China and other developed parts of the world. Um, they are generally agreed on the fact that Europe um, reached this dominant position because Europe, in contrast, for instance, to China, was highly decentralized. Europe was a political anarchy consisting at some times of thousands of independent political units of free cities, very small states, and so forth. And again, recall uh, in, in what respect this is an advantage. Uh, very small states are faced with the problem of exit. People just simply leave if they are not treated well and go someplace else. On the other hand, if you have a world state, then you have all over the world the same tax and regulation structure. Wherever you go, the same tax and regulation structure applies. There's no reason for anyone to ever go from one place to another. And because of that, there's no longer any danger for a state uh, that people simply leave because the state becomes too oppressive. So Europe owes its unique wealth uh, to the fact that it was a political anarchy with a tremendous amount of political competition between small units. Um, what follows from this is, of course, that, one, that what one should ask for is to, again, establish a Europe that consists of thousands of Liechtensteins and Monacos and Andorras uh, and San Marinos and places like Hong Kong and uh, Singapore and Newman, small Swiss cantons um, and so forth. Um, if you have a small state, as I explained, this small state must engage in liberal domestic policies. Uh, otherwise, people will simply leave the state. Um, large states can get away with high-tax policies. Small states will be finished very quickly if they engage in high-tax policies. Small states must engage in free trade. They cannot engage in protectionist measures. Just imagine a place like Monaco or Liechtenstein uh, deciding that I will no longer trade with the rest of the world. I will engage in self-sufficient production. We make trade with the rest of the world extremely difficult. Now, what you can predict in this case is, of course, that the population in Monaco uh, will be starving very quickly, and uh, in a few days, or at least in a few weeks, you will have people dying from starvation. Um, on the other hand, imagine a state like the United States, or the European community as a whole, saying we will have no longer trade with anybody outside the United States or outside of the European community. Now, 
then the standard of living in the United States or in Europe would, of course, decline. But people would not starve in the streets. Uh, people would not die en masse. Um, so, again, the advantage of small states is they see uh, very quickly when they engage in, yeah, in unproductive economic policies. They must engage in free trade, otherwise they will be severely punished for it. Um, further, small states eliminate what we can describe as forced integration that we have in all large uh, centralized states in the United States and in the European community. What I mean by forced integration is the result of mass immigration that we have allowed to take place in order to destroy regional uh, identities which stand in the way of the ambitions of states to centralize. Um, forced integration, uh, creating multicultural uh, societies, uh, does not lead to peaceful relationships. Um, it leads to unnecessary conflict. Um, people uh, like to associate because they are similar. And they engage in free trade with people who are different. But to be forced to live next door to people who are very different from oneself and who are unwilling to assimilate uh, usually causes a tremendous amount of conflict. And small states, of course, have the possibility to have their own admission standards. They can determine this is the type of people that we would like to join us and this is the type of people that we would not like to join us. Small states would be, very, would be forced to be very careful in this. You realize if small numbers come to your place, you can assimilate small numbers of strangers, of foreigners, of people who are different. They have to learn the language of the place where they like to live. If people come in large numbers, then there is no need anymore to assimilate. Then you can build, uh, form ghettos and speak, maintain your own culture and religion in, within, your own, within your own societies. And this is what we see in the United States happening. Uh, and this is what we see in Europe happening, that the numbers of immigrants coming is so overwhelming that we are no longer able to successfully assimilate these people. They are not willing to become like those where they want to live, which one would think is a perfect normal thing. Uh, they insist that they can maintain their own cultures, their own way of life in completely different societies and expect that, that we find this just marvelous and beautiful and all the rest of it, which of course most people do not find at all. So small states have a tremendous advantage in this, in this regard also. Let me make an additional point connected with this. There is a danger, a real danger, that all welfare states uh, that we have in Europe and increasingly also in the United States, will eventually collapse financially because they cannot pay the pensions that they promised the elderly. Um, uh, they cannot pay uh, the health care provisions that they allow people. Um, that is, they will be bankrupt 
in a similar way as communism 15 years ago uh, showed itself to be a bankrupt, a bankrupt system. When the European states will become bankrupt, then we can expect that severe social conflicts will break out. Um, and severe social conflicts uh, will become particularly dramatic if you have multicultural societies. Um, then you will quickly have uh, civil war on hand because uh, the lines of these uh, um, uh, conflicts over, over uh, uh, scarce resources uh, will then form along ethnic, uh, ethnic, linguistic, or uh, religious, uh, religious lines. So again, if you, if you want to prevent uh, potential civil war, then again, uh, it seems that small states are the best way um, to do this. Um, finally, the small states, and this brings me to my point that I made about monetary centralization. Uh, small states can no longer insist, the larger the number is, can no longer insist, I have my own paper money, you have your own paper money, the third state has, has his own paper money and so forth. That makes trade almost impossible if we have thousands of different paper monies. Small states would be forced again to adopt an international commodity money standard such as we had in the 19th century, namely an international gold standard or international silver standard or something of that nature and would make it impossible for states to engage in deliberate inflationary policies. Um, let me to, to summarize some of these things and also to expand a little bit read you a wonderful quote from Johann Wolfgang Goethe um, who was uh, interviewed by one of his fans in 1828 that is at a time when Germany consisted still of uh, 39 independent states what he thought about German unity and, um, and Goethe said I do not fear that Germany will not be united. She is united because the German Thaler and Groschen have the same values throughout the entire empire and because my suitcase can pass through all 36 states without being opened. Germany is united in the areas of weights and measures, trade and migration and a hundred similar things. One is mistaken, however, if one thinks that Germany's unity should be expressed in the form of one large capital city and this great, that this great city might benefit the masses in the same way that it might benefit the development of a few outstanding individuals. A thoughtful Frenchman, I believe Dopin, has drawn up a map regarding the state of culture in France indicating the higher or lower level of enlightenment of its various departments by lighter or darker colors. There we find especially in the southern provinces, far away from the capital, some departments painted entirely in black, indicating a complete cultural darkness. Would this be the case if the beautiful France had ten centers instead of just one, from which light and life radiated? What makes Germany great is her admirable popular culture, which has penetrated all parts of the empire evenly. And, it is not the many and is it not the many different princely residences from hence this culture springs and which are the bearers and curators? Just assume that for centuries only the two capitals of Vienna and Berlin had existed in Germany or even only a single one. Then I'm wondering what would have happened to the German culture and the widespread prosperity that goes hand in hand with culture. Germany has 20 universities strewn out across the entire empire, 
more than 100 public libraries and a similar number of art collections and natural museums. For every prince wanted to attract such beauty and good. Gymnasia and technical and industrial schools exist in abundance. Indeed, there is hardly a German village without its own school. How is it in this regard in France? Furthermore, look at the number of German theaters which exceeds 70. The appreciation of music and song and their performance is nowhere as prevalent as in Germany. Then think about cities such as Dresden, Munich, Stuttgart, Kassel, Braunschweig, Hanover and similar ones. Think about the energy that these cities represent. Think about the effects they have on neighboring provinces and ask yourself if all of this would exist if such cities had not been the residences of princes for a long time. Frankfurt, Bremen, Hamburg, Lübeck are large and brilliant and their impact on the prosperity of Germany is incalculable. Yet, would they remain what they are if they were to lose their independence and be incorporated as provincial cities into one great German empire? I have reason to doubt that. Um, and I think good is, again, recall this is in 1828. Um, I have, I tend to agree completely with, with good. Um, it was precisely this, yeah, this anarchic structure that existed in Germany that was responsible for the fact that Germany became, in Europe, the, the, the leading scientific and cultural uh, country in, um, uh, in Europe, uh, far uh, outpassing uh, a country like France that had been uh, centralized with all cultural life taking place in, um, in Paris. Um, and I think the decline of German cultural life begins in 1871 uh, with the unification of, uh, of Germany. Of course, it takes a few generations before the decline becomes really apparent. Um, uh, but uh, uh, the fact that Germany was split up in many places was responsible for the fact that they had a large number of very excellent universities, whereas in France, of course, you had just one excellent uh, university. The same applies by and large to the unification of Italy. I think that was also a big mistake uh, which occurred in the 1860s. Um, Italy would have also prospered more uh, if they would have remained splintered as they were. Um, the last remark concerns the country from which I come, the United States. Um, there, uh, initially, of course, we did have significant competition between the various states um, until the war of southern independence. That is what in Europe is usually referred to as the American Civil War. What people in, in the southern states of the United States call the war of northern aggression. Um, this war created for the first time an overwhelming, mighty central state in the United States uh, that concentrated most of the powers in its hand and, uh, and uh, made it more or less impossible for uh, the individual states, which initially constituted the United States, to separate themselves uh, from the central government. Again, in my view, this has not led to more prosperity and more uh, cultural development taking place in the United States, but it has stifled the economic development uh, in the United States because it has reduced competition between the individual states. The United States would have been, again, or well, maybe not the United States, but the same territory would have been far wealthier than it actually is if it would have remained uh, separated uh, as it was before uh, 18, uh, 1860, 1861. 
Um, so I believe that we have overwhelming reasons to think that uh, the future of Europe is not the European integration and the creation of a central European state uh, dominated in some way by the United States and then maybe building out of this even larger uh, political units. Um, the, future, the future of Europe um, is uh, to think back to what we had uh, during long times of the Middle Ages, a highly decentralized Europe with many interspersed free cities, um, increasing the competition between um, uh, political units. That is what will create prosperity and and liberty and peaceful relationships uh, between uh, the people of different ethnic and cultural background. Thank you very much.